Hey everybody, it's Jeremy here with uh, Brian, and we're going to be talking about a uh, you know a peculiar uh, topic tonight. Um, something that I've been you know on for a long time, but I've kind of backed off for a while now. Is this whole street preaching movement, and uh, we're going to be discussing many different topics. And uh, um, um, <laughs> it started preaching. It started preaching out of my phone. You know, and uh, uh -huh. I was talking here, so <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'm gonna pass over to Brian. He's gonna ask me some questions, and we're just gonna talk about this. All right. Yes. So. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, basically, we're gonna go over just a couple things in this. Um, I know Brother Jeremy has a history in uh, street preaching. I myself do as well, a little bit. Uh, different groups that we you know did street preaching with but we're going to go over some of uh, Jeremy's you know, and, and his and his wife's uh, different connections to different street preaching groups out there I'll talk a little bit about mine as well but then we're going to go over the main beliefs of the street preaching movement I, I like to call them street papists I think that's more accurate <laughs> and uh, but the uh, number one will be about their definition of repentance Okay, the the definition of repentance that these guys use that leads into work salvation. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, then the thing of no eternal security. There are attacks on eternal security. Uh, sinless perfection hypocrisy. They claim to have sinless perfection, but uh, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, they they claim it, but they don't live it. I'd say it that way. Next, the thing of strife and contention being their measure of holiness. In other words, how much they can get people riled up, how much anger, how much media coverage. That's another big thing. Um, that's kind of meriting their salvation, really. Um, the fact that they're non-dispensation will be the next point. We'll get into some of that stuff. And then that they're not King James Bible believing. They'll use new versions. They'll contradict the scriptures. Um, so we'll get into that. And then after that, we're going to name some names of some of the more dangerous uh, street preaching movements out there and uh, just to warn people and tell people a little bit about each one. So having said that, go ahead, brother, you can tell about your experiences and get into a little bit of what your wife went through as well. All right. Well, as you guys know, um, if you've heard my testimony, I started off, you know, getting involved with the street preaching movement. Uh, it was originally with Levi Price. I became great friends with him and, you know, became a ministry partner with him, running a pal talk group and stuff like that. And a podcast with him. Um, you know, I had a podcast way back then called the way by fire. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that or not, but, um, you know, it sounds charismatic, you know, but, um, anyway, I did that with him for about two years, you know, and I street preached for about, you know, a couple of years as well. And as I was, get, you know, in that involved with him and stuff like that, I started getting in contact with some other street preachers, you know, uh, the Jesse Morales, the Kerrigan Skellies and, um, you know, the Reuben Israels of, you know, all that stuff. Um, and then I finally got to go out on my first street preaching, you know, uh, movement or street preaching event. It was a uh, this a uh, rock and roll um concert it was in tennessee and uh that was my first time and then i went down to new orleans uh to mardi gras which was a bad idea don't ever go to mardi gras uh street preaching that is one of the most vexing disgusting filthy things you can ever do you know and yet these guys are going out there and doing it and they don't have any conviction i i mean i had to step back because it was so gross you know i had to step back and say okay this is just nasty i i was about ready to puke I mean, because of all the vexation and stuff like that. And then, you know, I went to a uh, gay pride parade um, and I've ran into other street preachers there. You know, uh, Kerrigan Skelly was one of them. Um, he has a, a channel called Refuting Calvinism or something like that. I can't remember what it's called. He also mm -hmm. has a church called Refining Fire, um, which is, you know, what does that sound like to you? Charismatic. Um you know, and then uh, Jesse Morale was the one down in New Orleans. I've, you know, I've I've been around those guys. You know, I've been to about 
you know, about, I say about seven or eight events that I've been street preaching at, you know, as far as my wife goes, she used to be a member of team Jesus preachers, um, down in uh, South Florida. Uh, they live in, uh, Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, I spent there, I, I lived there for about a year, uh, with her. And that is the most rotten, one of the most rotten, disgusting places I've ever been as well. It's just basically a little, a little new Orleans pretty much. And yet you're a Bible believing Christian and you live down there and you don't have a problem with it. Something's wrong. Something's very wrong. And it's very expensive to live down there. It's ridiculous. Like a one bedroom, you know, apartment is like one thousand to twelve hundred dollars a month. It's ridiculous. And a lot of families, you know, they live in one house together. You know, there's like four different families living in one four bedroom house together. It's just ridiculous because that's the way they make it down there. But that's beside the point. You know, um, I started getting some, uh, I started getting like more aware of these guys, uh, the way they approach things, you know, they just seem like they're just always trying to antagonize somebody and then they will always throw the card out. Well, if you hit me, I'm going to sue you, you know, kind of thing. And then they'll make somebody mad and they'll, they'll say, don't touch me. Don't touch me. You know, you hit me, I'll sue you, you know, stuff like that. They would just dying for you to hit them. You know, if you were just a, you know, an innocent bypasser, you know, whatever, they were just dying for you to hit them. And just, they will just say some very vile things, you know, like you'll deserve, you deserve rape, you know, till they'll tell that to immodest women and they'll tell sodomites and stuff like that. They, you know, I hope you get AIDS and stuff like that. And, and they'll get very, very detailed sexually, you know, out on the streets and start talking about parts and stuff like that. Um, that's very disgusting. You don't do that as a Christian, not at all. You keep that stuff discreet and you try, you try your best not to be so vulgar with it, you know, and say, well, you know, God was made for God made man and woman to be you know, one flesh. God did not make man and man to be one flesh. The Bible does not teach that. It's that simple. Why do you have to go in such detail about somebody's private parts? You know, I don't understand that. Um, and I think a lot, a lot of what it is, I think a lot of these guys are just secretly perverts. And by, by their doctrine, when you hear this, you'll you understand what I'm talking about. I mean, it's some of the most disgusting doctrines you've ever heard. They basically make God into the likeness of a man. Um, but but Amy was a member of the street preaching movement, Team Jesus Preachers. And, uh, and if you know Amy's testimony, she was, um, you know, she's been married once before. I'm sure that's going to get twisted on me somehow. But um. Amy's been married once before uh, to a drug addict who was psycho. He was, who's threatened to, you know, do all kinds of things to her and stuff like that. And team Jesus preacher says she had no right for divorce when this man's been out at the bars cheating on her and stuff like that. So many times there's been so many witnesses and stuff like that said that he's been with other women. So um, she has every right to leave him. Okay. I'm about to be doing a video soon on this other witch transform wife she basically believes the same thing and she's very much loved among the street preachers too very interesting so mm -hmm. uh, but, uh anyway they basically told her that she had no right to leave and uh she has to stick it out and suffer I and mean, as far as i'm concerned that's roman catholicism you have to merit your salvation and that's what they got that's what these guys believe too by the way they believe they have to suffer in the flesh in order to be saved so because they're enduring to the end and um uh, Somehow that, you know, causing yourself to suffer merit salvation, you know, because they'll rip verses out of context that talk about Christian suffering and going through trials and stuff like that. And try to say, well, see, see, we're suffering. We, we make ourselves suffer. We have to suffer to earn favor. That's basically what they believe. I've heard I've heard out of the mouth of Levi Price, all these guys that you have to suffer, cause yourself to suffer. You know, you know, you have to chastise yourself, you know, and that's just it's just it's Roman Catholicism and it's penance. If you ever read the catechism, it's just a pen, form of penance, a sacrament, pretty much. So that, yeah. was, that was part of what woke you up to the whole thing, wasn't it, brother? Where you were kind of saying that you started to read the catechism and you started saying, wait a second here. This is a lot of what we're preaching here in this movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and how I got out of it is that um, I decided one day I wanted to learn about Catholicism because I was still green, you know, at the time. And I wanted to learn about Catholicism, what they actually believed. And when I read a catechism first time for myself, 
Um, it's I don't know where I did with it, but this one right here. When I read this for the first time myself, I realized these guys line up perfectly with this right here. You know, yeah, they don't do the whole Mary thing, but, you know, and the Immaculate Conception stuff. But, um, I mean, they line up perfectly as far as salvation goes, you know, that you have to do good works. You have to make yourself suffer. You have to do all this stuff. And and not to mention, most of them are post-trib, too, I might add. They, mm -hmm. Why? Because, you know, Catholics believe they must suffer for the faith, just like these guys are doing, you know, that you have to suffer. You just just pagan idea this it's just it's weird that you mm -hmm. have to suffer for you know to earn salvation you know and uh and i read this thing right here and i was like oh my lord what have i got myself into i was like how do i get out of this and so i tried doing the quiet <laughs> i tried doing the quiet escape you know and just kind of leaving and just not telling anybody why i left it didn't really work out too well <laughs> um <laughs> You know, there's videos against me. Um, Levi Price did on me after I left. And um, because he found out why I left, because I, I said he's a lost devil. He's going to hell because he believes that he believes in Roman Catholicism. He's just a papist. You know, he found out about it. He didn't, he didn't say one thing about being a Catholic in those videos, you know, that I, that I said that, you know. He just says, if you believe in uh, eternal security, you're going to hell. I mean, what a stupid, you know, <laughs> line of reasoning. Okay, so I trust in Jesus Christ's death on the cross and his blood that paid for my sins. I trust in that, and that somehow, uh, that somehow damns me to hell. Okay, yeah. but, you that know. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so, so, yeah, and he attacked me, and all of his little goons came after and attacked me. I had probably four or 5,000 people call, text me, email me, whatever, Facebook me. Um, whatever you name it, they all attacked me. They all came after me, you know, and you know, my life got rough there for a while, you know, and, uh, and this is before really I started watching, I started watching Brian's videos. I mean, I was kind of on my own, you know, I took about, you know, a couple people with me and they're still friends with me today. Some of them are, but majority of the people, they kind of just went and did their own thing now. You know, they real they see the lies of Levi Price and all these guys, but they just kind of went and did their own thing. At the time, I didn't really have any direction, so I didn't really, I couldn't really just put my foot down and just start a ministry right then. I wasn't ready. You know, it, it takes a man a while before you're ready to just, you know, start doing, you know, making videos and start preaching and stuff like that. I mean, you have to know you're ready and you have to, uh, you can't just jump in and be a novice because then that's when you fall into pride, you know, and that's why I waited a while before I started doing it. So, but anyway, um, so yeah, that's that story. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it back over to Brian. Okay. Yeah. Well, my, my, uh, experience with it, um, was, uh, I was going to a Baptist church the one time, Liberty Baptist church in effort Pennsylvania. I'm from Pennsylvania originally and uh, went the one week and there was this uh, guy named James Lyman, James the preacher, they call him. And he's been kicked off YouTube so many times and, and he was on God tube for a while and he got kicked off of that. And, and uh, he's, he's a, he's, I wouldn't classify him as, you know, the team Jesus or whatever type like that Reuben Israel type. Um, uh, he's, he's pretty straight on most of his doctrine, but it's the same. He, he's very controversial. He gets people very angry. Um, he went into a Catholic church the one time and was yelling and screaming at the people in the Catholic church and <laughs> posted the video and, uh, you know, just real uh, confrontational and everything. And, and uh, I mean, when he was there at Liberty Baptist, when I was going there, he was standing up on the, the front pews and he was screaming at people and everything else. And, and so I went out a couple of times with those guys, uh, the, the Baptists there and, and everything. And it was, it was very similar to the whole thing of, of, uh, telling, you know, yelling at people that they're going to hell and you're getting people angry and everything else. And, um, my experience with the whole street preaching movement, I don't, I've never gone with, uh, with, uh, you know, the guys you were mentioning brother, but, um, just street preachers, preachers in general, writing back and forth with them and whatever else. My experience with them is um, there's a very big pride issue there. And um, 
they get into this thing of just they they if you're not preaching on the street then there's you know you're not really up on their level kind of a deal and uh you know i think in some cases it could be okay but most of what i've seen it's all about pride so um i've done it a couple times myself and things we did it with bible believers fellowship and we tried to do it a little bit differently but you're just you're confronting people you're going to get the people mad it's going to get you riled up yourself and you you know it can just get out of control pretty quickly and uh but i think that's pretty much enough about uh you know um you know what we've gone through in our past so, i mean we both do have some experience with the street preaching movement mine's slightly different than yours brother but you know Still, I think some somewhat of the same spirit though in both groups, you know. Yeah, I mean, I like to revert back to the five prides of Satan, is what I like to call it. You know, in Isaiah chapter five, not or Isaiah fourteen. I mean, uh, I'll read them real quick because uh, this is basically what these guys do, and it's the same thing. I mean, they're of their father, the devil, and uh, and we'll get into more of this here in a minute. But I want to read this real quick because I don't think a you know a, a sermon like this will be right without some scripture involved of course um says how art thou fallen from heaven o lucifer son of the morning how art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations but thou hast said in thine heart now listen to this i will ascend into heaven you see that i will ascend into heaven you see how they what they're doing i can ascend into heaven by keeping the law perfectly all right i will exalt my throne above the stars of god I will sit upon I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will send above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. You know who the only one is holy is? It's God. Re Revelation chapter 15 says, Thou art the only one that's holy. Okay. We are not holy. We are only holy because of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Okay. And these guys are going out and saying, Well, I can be like the most high. Exactly mm -hmm. like Satan exactly like satan they are the fault they are their father the devil so yeah. but so yeah i mean it's the five prize of satan that's exactly what they believe you know what the number five represents too by the way death mm -hmm. i want to mention that too so yep absolutely and i would say that probably the number one verse i've ever heard i don't know if you heard the same thing but uh isaiah chapter 58 verse one as the kind of the uh go-to verse for the whole street preaching movement the guys i've been around i'll let you get there yeah are yeah. you there yeah cry aloud spare not lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of jacob their sins yeah uh, you know again crossing dispensational lines going back there you know to where the prophets were dealing with the nation you know and it's my people um americans are not my people <laughs> uh it's it's the jews it's talking about that but uh that's what you know i've heard the street preachers they'll you know they'll do that yeah so, yeah but, i mean i've heard the same uh verse preached before too um let's see here there's one more i think it was in proverbs and it's kind of the same thing it's very similar Actually, no, I was wrong. Uh, it's Jeremiah 4, 5 is one I've heard. Okay. It says, I'll let you get there first. Okay. All right. Declare ye in Judah and pub publish in Jerusalem and say, blow ye the trumpet in the land. Cry together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense city, cities. So, again, who's, who's the verse talking about here? It's talking about Israel. Declare in Judah. Are we in Judah? Are we in Jerusalem? Are we in the land? No. So, that's another yeah. one to use. And uh, while we're on this subject, you know, the I think the best place of scripture to uh, refute this a lot of this whole street preaching movement if you go to second timothy chapter two um six uh definitely you know makes a problem for those 
most of the street preaching I've ever been involved with or seen. Um, 25 and 26. Uh, chapter chapter two, verse 23 through 26. Okay, 23 and 26. Okay. Um, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle uh, to all men, apt to teach, patient, and in meekness instruction, those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledge, acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another one, too, that um, I like to use against these guys is this one right here. It's in Second Peter chapter 2. Um, all right, verse 8. Okay. It says, For that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. See, that was me. I was vexed by their unlawful deeds. Um, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government and presumptuous are they self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. You see that right there? They're self-willed. They're all about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusa accusation against them before the Lord but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of things and that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption see they want to be justified by themselves they want to be justified by their good works so they're going to perish in their own corruption um, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it Pleasure to riot in the daytime, spots they are, and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Exactly. Right there. Bam. They riot in the daytime and they sport themselves. Well, they do. And, you know, out there with their bullhorns and stuff like that and, you know, screaming their garbage out on the streets. And yet um, they're riding themselves. They're sporting themselves. It's all about them. See, I got to merit my own salvation. I can be like the most high by going out here and blowing my trumpet loud. See, it's about man becoming God. That's what this whole thing's about. But we'll get more into that here in a little bit. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And it's funny too, verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. You know, why do you go to a place where women are dressed with barely any clothes on? You know, because they enjoy it. Exactly. They enjoy it. You know, and, you know, in heart, they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. You know, like you were saying earlier, these guys are living in areas where it's extremely expensive to live. You know. Yep. Like Reuben Israel and all them, they live in L.A. You know, it's just as bad as South Florida, you know. Um, and I think Jesse, if I'm not mistaken, lives in Dallas, Texas. You know, hmm. what's wrong with this picture here? You know. Yeah. Uh, and there's also another one called the Seattle Street Preachers. So there you go. Um, I mean, they live in these big cities. Why? You know, you're a Bible-believing Christian. You're not vexed by the wickedness going on in these big cities. I don't like being in them very long, you know. I mean, the only big city I really like going to just because the atmosphere is it's really not that bad is uh, Nashville. You know, it's very southern, humble. You know, most other big cities out there, they're just disgusting. Would I want to live up, up there? No. I couldn't stand in the city life. I just can't. But going there and visiting, sure, you know. But living there, I don't see how you can do it on a day-to-day -day basis. No way. Yeah. Well, let's get into the thing of the main beliefs of the street papists. Um, <laughs> number one being repentance. And I, I have it written here. I think the way that they define repentance is um, doesn't mean to turn from self-righteousness. It means rather to turn to self-righteousness. You know, that's that's the repentance that they believe in, you know, and uh, you, you see them and they'll have the big T-shirt repent on it, you know, or the big sign held up, you know, repent and everything else. And um, you listen to what they're saying. And, uh, you know, it, it's this whole thing of you have to have this. Um, you know, this sinless perfection, basically. Yeah. 
Um, they believe repentance means to stop sinning. And this is the one of their favorite verses I like to quote. John 8, 11. Okay. All right. Just let me know when you get there. I'm there. All right. She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. See, they'll say, see, Jesus said to stop sinning. So you better stop sinning right now. That's exactly what they do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, one more they like to go to. It's Matthew 5, 48. Which again, I mean, it's the Beatitudes. I mean, it's not even dispensationally for us. Matthew chapter 5, verse what was it? 48. 48. Okay. It says, um, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is, a, is perfect. There you go. You gotta be perfect, you see? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. There's oh. another one, too. I can I've heard this one first John chapter 3 uh, Verse 6 Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not whosoever sinneth hath not seen him neither known him. Yep you know, Talking about imputed righteousness theme, you know Your sins are not held uh, They're not put on your account basically when you get saved. Yep. yep. Jesus Christ God sometimes with us from all sin because you know, it's kind of funny these guys it's just talk about the cherry picking of verses you know they'll they'll skip first john chapter 1 verse 7 you know where it talks about the blood of jesus christ his son cleanseth us from all sin but then they'll go to chapter 3 verse 6 and they'll use that yeah and they'll actually skip verse 8 too where it says you know if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us they'll mm -hmm. skip right over that one you know oh you see that's your lost past life you see that's what that means okay yeah sure it is you know i mean there's a ton um, we're gonna refute i'm actually gonna refute sinless perfection tonight too. i got a bunch of verses i can cover like that real quick so okay. uh, when we get to that point we'll we'll go there uh, but yeah repentance basically means to stop sinning when you come to god you have to stop sinning and they love to quote luke 13 3 which says except you repent ye shall likewise perish well i mean we obviously know what repent means turn from yourself and, and your self-righteousness not turning from you know turning back to yourself and trying to keep the law that's not what the whole thing means it's not about you doing good works and trying to earn salvation by trying to stop sinning that's not what repentance means that is a blatant heresy okay mm -hmm. right repentance is you come to the end of yourself and realize you're no good it's that yep. simple okay you're guilty before god you know the, the law is a schoolmaster to bring us on to christ okay the law is not for a righteous man first timothy chapter one verse eight it is for the sinner okay the ungodly you know and so on so uh, a righteous man does not need the law of god okay but the law of god is there for the sinner see they don't understand that they're sinners that's the that's the whole issue here they never come to the end of their self and realize that they're sinners so that's why they say okay i see jesus christ saying repent i must stop sinning okay i gotta just be completely sinless and and that way you know i can earn favor with the lord you know Mm -hmm. And and they'll say, well, and they'll use verses like Matthew 24, 13. He that endureth in the end, the same shall be saved. Not even written to a Christian, you see, because Matthew 24, 13 is dispensationally in the time of Jacob's troubles. Not even written to a Christian. Okay. Matthew 24, 44 through 51, they'll try to use those. They will try to use the, the, the foolish virgins. They will try to use the unprofitable servant in Matthew 25. I mean, just on and on about how you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to endure to the end. You got, you know, you got to pick up your cross and follow Jesus daily. If you're not, if you, if you miss your cross one day, then you're going to hell. I mean, come on. Picking up your cross is about discipleship. It has nothing to do with salvation. You know, it's Jesus did not say that to be saved. Jesus did not come to earth to set up a perpetual system of works. He came here to die for our sins. Okay, and his blood cleanses us from all sin. Okay, when we believe the gospel, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. So, these guys also do not believe in the imputed righteousness of Christ. They believe it's your righteousness that saves you, and they don't. They don't actually admit that either. They won't sit there and say, "Well, it's not." See, it's not our righteousness. You see, it's the Holy Spirit working in us to make us righteous. 
you know, so they'll, they'll twist it. They'll do those little word games, you know, and uh, they'll say, they'll, they'll use terms like we're in the spirit, you know, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll use, uh, they'll use first John chapter one, verse seven. It's funny. You said that because they'll actually twist this verse right here. And it says, um, but if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. See, you have to walk in the light in order that for that blood to cleanse you. You know, that's what they say. Okay. But here's the problem. You can, there's how you nail them to the wall right here with that. First Thessalonians chapter five. I know how to answer these guys from every corner. So, I mean, they're, they're easy to me. They're like, it's like playing, uh, like playing T-ball with a three-year-old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was in this whole group for a long time. I understand them very well. But it says, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light. And the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. See? We walk in the light as he's in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. See? You're in the light. You're already in the light, so the blood cleanses you from all sin. How does that work? How do you, you don't have to continue to walk in the light, okay? You're already there. You're already there when you got saved. See, they won't they won't go here at all. They will they'll ignore this like the plague. And here's one too they like to quote for this whole sinless perfection thing that I totally forgot about actually. Um, Hebrews chapter five. All right. Yep. Verse nine. Okay. It says, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. See, you got to obey him. That's how, that's what, that's how I define it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, and that's another thing too. They'll use that right there and say, see, you got to obey Jesus Christ and what he said. You know, and they'll use the ones like this right here. Um, what's funny is, what does it mean to obey him? You know, what does that mean? Well, first of all, you're dealing with another dispensation here. OK, mm -hmm. but I do believe what Hebrews is right here is transitional. There is a sense of obeying that we have to do. What is it? Well, if you go to Second Thessalonians chapter one, which I think this is what ty is tying into this. Um, it's verse. um uh, Verse eight. Okay. It says in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You obey the gospel. And how do you obey the gospel? You believe on it. Simple, mm -hmm. you know, but yet, you know, they'll say it's obedience is you have to obey Christ in his words. It is so dumb. Yeah. Well, they, you know, all works salvation. That's to I me mean, we can kind of transition to the next point because it's about works salvation. You know, all works salvationists, they 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 cannot give up on themselves, like you said earlier, you know, the the whole thing of the self righteousness. Um, they have to believe that they're not that bad. Yeah. And you know, I can well I can have a part in salvation and things. No, you don't. I mean, Titus chapter three, verse five, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You know, I mean, where does it fit in there? Where does your works, where does obedience fit in? It doesn't. Exactly. And uh, another one here that they'll like, they'll avoid is uh, second Timothy chapter one says right here. Actually, I'll start in verse eight. Second Timothy one, eight says. Be not, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who had saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Mm -hmm. um, another one, Philippians chapter 3. Verse nine. Okay. 
It says, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. So there you go. I mean, I mean, there's so much more I could cover, you know, uh, a good one is Galatians chapter two, verse 21, where it says that if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So if we had to keep the law perfectly, then Christ died for no reason. Pretty yeah. much, you know, exactly. Um, I talked to a guy years ago, um, son of a Methodist preacher down in West Virginia. And, um, and he's, and he told me, he said, uh, and I go something about, you know, I, I think I'm going to make it in. And I, you know, I said, you know, if you died today, do you know if you go to heaven? And he said, he said, I think, I think I'd be all right. <laughs> I said, um, you know, did the, so what was the death of Jesus all about? I mean, did, did he die for the really bad people or something? <laughs> you know, you can make it on your own good works, but uh, Jesus, you know, he had to die for the real bad ones. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, see, again, it's self-righteousness. They'll look at somebody like Jeffrey Dahmer and they'll say, well, you know, it's funny. They'll, they'll, they'll say somebody like that can't get saved, you know, because all the horrible things he did, you know, that's ridiculous, you know. But they'll look at somebody that's like living a clean cut life and they'll say, oh, yeah, he, you know, he's easy to get saved. But yeah, he's probably the most prideful, arrogant man you ever run into, you know, unlike Jeffrey Dahmer, who knew he was disgusting, you know. Yep. And, and that and that's what this whole thing is about. It's an enlightenment. It's just a enlightenment of yourself. I mean, it's what this whole thing is about. So mm -hmm. um, let's keep going here. Um, all right. Next one. Now, what are the. What are the verses that they would use, in other words, where they would, you know, we've been t talking about some of the things about the repent and whatever else. But, you know, if you would confront them and say, how do you get saved or whatever, you know, um, I mean, we've gone over some of them. But are there any other verses where they would, you know, kind of go into the thing of works, having to work for salvation? OK, there's several of them, actually. Um, let's see, I'm trying to figure out where to start at. Um, we did John 8, 11. OK. Um, all right, I got one here for you. I think I've talked to you about this one before. Uh, Luke 13, 24. Okay. It says, strive to enter in at that gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. There's one. See, they'll say you have to strive. See, you have to strive. You have to run the race, you know, for salvation, um, which is ridiculous. It's not even what the verse is talking about here, you know. Um, and again, you're dealing with something that's parallel to what's going on in the Beatitudes, you know, the narrow gate, you know, not even our dispensation. I, I hear that one a lot of preached among the holiness. you got to enter this broad gate. See, you can either go down the broad gate, OK, or you can go down the narrow gate. If you stray off the narrow gate, you're going to end up back on the broad gate. See, mm -hmm. they have a gray area mentality of Christians, you know, that you can be in a gray area, a gray state. You know, you can ride the fence, as they say. Um, and, uh, and how they define that is revelation chapter three with the lukewarm church, you know, um, they'll say, well, see, you can be a lukewarm Christian and go to hell. You know, you can fall into lukewarmness. You can backslide, you know, and they'll quote verses in the old Testament, you know, like Ezekiel three twenty, um, Ezekiel 18, 24. Um, they'll quote those verses like that right there. And they'll say, and they'll, and they'll say, see, you know, if a righteous man turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, he shall die in his sin. You see, you can lose your salvation. Hey, uh, buddy, that was talking about under the law. We're not under the law today, you know. Um, they'll use that one. Um, mm -hmm. But the most but, common ones they'll use, as we'll get into this next thing here in a minute, is this thing between uh, the different types of sin. See, they label they have two different types of sins. You got willful and ignorant. And just like the Roman Catholic does, they have what do you call it? venial and mortal sins. Uh -huh. I in here. It's the same thing. Um, just a slight, maybe just some slight twist to each one of them. But, you know, they're basically the same thing. And how they define this is Hebrews 10, 26. And uh, we can turn there. Okay. Go ahead. It says, for if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remains no more sacrifice for sins. You see, if you sin willfully after you get 
come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you are not saved. You're going to hell. So here's some more sacrifices at that point. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and then, but they're defining it as the, uh, you know, the mortal sins. They, they wouldn't go with the venial sins because they commit those all the time. Yeah, they do. That's funny. They'll commit all the ignorant stuff and they'll say, well, let's see, there's no, there's no sacrifice for that. That's not open rebellion against God. You know, ha ha. Well, I got you there. Um, and they'll say, well, see when it says that you're that, you know, first John chapter three, verse six, they'll use that. See, that's only for those that are not willfully sinning. Where does it say that anywhere in the text? See, they have to add to scripture. What's the Bible say about adding to scripture? Add not thou unto thy words and least he, least he reprove thee and be found a liar. Mm hmm. Proverbs 30, verse 6. Uh, what's the thing of ignorant sin? Well, if you go to the Old Testament here, let me find this verse reference real quick. And while you're looking for that, I'll just say this too. Um, the whole thing about, uh, you know, this will work salvation, of course, is going to transition into the next point of no eternal security because um, that's really what it is. If you believe that you can lose your salvation, then you're saved by works. Yeah. Simple. Um, but, you know, I was telling you, I had to run in with an older man here in the area, you know, a week or two ago. And uh, he went on to the thing of Balaam, you know, how that Balaam is a proof that of a man that lost his salvation. <laughs> and I'm going, okay, <laughs> Old Testament here, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so whatever. But go ahead. Did you find your uh, verse? Yeah, right here. Numbers chapter 15, verse 23. See, they'll say, well, see, there's no requirement for ignorant sins. Well, see, I got you there because there is. Um, let me know when you get there, brother. Yep, I'm there. All right. Even all that the Lord had commanded you by the hand of Moses from the day that the Lord commanded Moses and henceforward among your generations, then it shall be. If ought be committed by ignorance without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregation shall offer one young bullock for a burnt offering for a sweet savor unto the Lord with his meat offering and his drink offering according to the manner and one kid of the goats for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel and it shall be forgiven them for it is ignorance and they shall bring their offering offering a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord and their sin offering before the Lord for their ignorance. Uh Oh, we got a problem here. See, I thought, you know, I thought ignorance was not rebellion. You know, yes, it is all sins transgression of god's law you see mm -hmm. that's that's the whole issue here um when it comes to sin sin is a transgression of god's law and the law sin is a knowledge of the law law is a knowledge of sin okay and so therefore if you're not if you're ignorantly sinning you're still breaking the law and the bible says in james chapter 2 verse 10 that if you commit one sin you're damned okay so how do you get those sins clean cleared up you know, by the shedding of blood, there's there's no remission, the Bible says. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. So what's the issue here? They don't believe in the blood atonement of Christ. That's what it that's what it's all about. You see, they deny the imputed righteousness of Christ and they'll say it's a myth. And they justify themselves because of they'll say ignorance is not open rebellion, so therefore we don't have to worry about that. Oh yeah, you do. And they're gonna go to hell because of that, you see. They can't admit the fact that they're dirty, you know, because they're not committing committing outward ordinances. And with that being said, we'll go into the eternal security thing now. Mm -hmm. um, so the whole thing with the eternal security thing is that they don't believe that you're eternally secure. See, if you fall back or, you know, you do this or do that. And that's where the whole changed life comes in, too, for a born again believer. They don't believe in that either. They don't believe in spiritual regeneration of a believer. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you taught these guys and they'll say, well, see, if you if you believe in eternal security, that means that you can you can go and live and party and drink it up and stuff like that. Yep. None of us ever said that. Nobody's ever said that. See, they've not been born again. They have not been spiritually regenerated. You can tell by their actions, by the way they talk, you know, and because they sit there and say stuff like that. They've not experienced, you know, what it means to be a Christian. You know, they have not experienced that. It's all about, you know, I got to do this. You know, again, going back to the satanic thing, the satanic philosophy, I will ascend the stars of, you know, I will ascend into heaven. I will ascend my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the most high. 
what they're doing. They're mocking. They're 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 basically imitating Satan. So the eternal security thing. Okay, one of their most. Go ahead. I'll, I'll just say this, but as far as the eternal security thing is concerned, that I've dealt with with these guys, um, they'll they'll search the scriptures, literally looking for anybody that was doing right, and then whatever else. And uh, they'll bring up uh, Simon the sorcerer is one that they'll bring up, and uh, they'll bring up which the my favorite one is Judas Iscariot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Amy got caught in Judas too by a Team Jesus preacher. So I just want to bring that up um, because she turned her back. She turned her back on them and said that they're a cult. So um, you know, good for her. You know, because I mean, they they are. But here's one they like to use that you probably don't hear much of. Have you ever heard a thing of, you know, Hymenaeus and Alexander, you know, where they were turned over to Satan? All right. Here's one they like to use. Do I pause the broadcast? Hello? Wait, Brian dropped out on me. Brian, you still with me? He's like, he's like screen just froze on me. All right, hold on. Yeah, his screen just froze on me. What in the world? Um. Okay. That's weird. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Start talking about something controversial. There he is. What happened? Able to hear I don't think we're able to hear him now. Can you hear me, brother? I don't think Satan likes what I'm saying right now. That's for sure. Um, that's weird. Hmm. Can you hear me? <laughs> what in the world, man? Can you hear me? If I got you on mute or something. Huh. Uh, no. Okay. There we go. I turned your volume up. Can you hear me? Okay. I hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. What in the world? That was, oh. that was weird. You just like stopped talking and then. Um, and you're like whole screen just, you know, <laughs> okay. But, uh, apparently That's Satan funny. didn't like what I had to say. When I, I, it's funny. As soon as I started talking about the five prides of Satan again, you just stopped, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? too many scriptures. But, yeah, scripture, yeah. I guess so, you know, but, um, yeah, what I was saying is here's one that they like to use getting back to what, uh, what I was talking about. The lose your salvation thing. Here's one they love to quote. It's First Timothy chapter one, verse nineteen through twenty. Okay. It says, "Holding faith in a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme." See, they'll say, "We'll see." They got delivered on Satan. They're going to hell. No, no. Uh, why do they need to be turned over to Satan if they're, you know, saved? Um, a lost person doesn't need to be turned over to Satan because Satan already has them. Mm -hmm. What's going on here? Well, here's a verse they will not read for two seconds. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Mm -hmm. yep. Brian knows where I'm going with this one. Yep. Um, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the soul, that the soul 
maybe saved in the day of the Lord, whatever. <laughs> I told him I messed that joke up, but um, uh -huh. deliver such one on a Satan for the destruction of the flesh, not soul or spirit. You know, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. See, the spirit's going to be saved, not the um, not the flesh. All right. The flesh right now is corruptible. It's not redeemed yet. Okay. It's not going to be redeemed until when? The rapture, the catching away. Right now, it's corruptible. It's still prone to sin. And see, what these guys don't understand is that when you get saved, there is a circumcision between your soul and your flesh. Your soul and your flesh are cut loose right now. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. We don't have to turn there, but it talks about the circumcision made without hands. Okay. And putting out the body of the sins of the flesh. So, and then, and the main issue again here is sin. Okay. And they, they say, well, you know, if you do these sins, you know, and do this sins and you lose your salvation. Okay. But how many sins do you do before you know, how can you know that? See, see, it's a guessing game all the time. You're constantly guessing and just trying to, you know, you just basically live in fear. The whole thing's about fear. Mm -hmm. um, Romans chapter, um, We'll turn it uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. The thing that fear is all about fear. Um, you know, that's how they control you. Mm -hmm. And and I believe this doctrine is a mind control type doctrine. Mm -hmm. okay. um, if I can get fear into your mind, then I can control you. You know, I can blackmail you. And say that if you don't stay with that wicked lost man, if you're a woman out there, and you don't stay with that wicked lost man, you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn forever. You better stay there and you better submit to him. That's exactly what they'll tell you. You know, if you're a, if you're a lady out there, you know, I've seen it happen. Every it, Why? It's to keep them in line. You see? Keep their followers in line. That's what the whole thing is about. Well, what's the Bible say about that? Um. It says right here in uh, verse um, 15 of Romans chapter 8. Go ahead. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. See, you're not a servant anymore. You're a son. Okay, you're a child of God. Okay, yes, we still serve the Lord as children, but we're not servants anymore. So using verses in Matthew 25 and trying to say we're the unprofitable servants, stuff like that does not work. Galatians chapter 4 verse 7 says we're no longer servants but sons. Okay? Mm -hmm. See, these guys don't understand that. They don't understand the fact that, they, that we are children. We are children of God. So let me ask you something. If you're a father or a parent out there um, and you have a child and he disobeys you, are you going to go out there and build a fire and throw him in it because he disobeys you? So... My question is, uh, is that if that's the case, then what kind of God are you serving? You know, he would throw yeah. his own children into a pit, a fire. So, but, um, but yeah, and go ahead, brother. I know you're about to say something. Say the whole thing of, uh, no eternal security. Then again, it transitions into the sinless perfection thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, because, you know, you have to be, you know, walking in obedience and the new life and whatever else. And they don't mean new life as in you're born again. You know, they, they mean, you know, you're striving against sin and all this other stuff. And um, I've seen it. I grew up around it, you know, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania with the Amish because they believe in the exact same thing. Um, and ironically, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, some of the Amish, when they convert uh, away from Amish, They'll actually get into the street preaching movement and the charismatic church as well. Mm. You know, no ties, I'm sure. No. no. <laughs> but, uh, just it's just coincidence. It's all coincidence. But you know, oh, yeah. when you get into the thing of this, what happens is when you get into sinless perfection in your mind, um, you can create this thing uh, which is very prevalent in church buildings where you have the double life. You go to church and you act a certain way, you dress a certain way, you put on your uniform, the whole deal, and your holiness, you know. And when you get that thing done, you can go off and, you know, look at your porn or do some other kind of sex perversion and whatever else. 
mm -hmm. drugs, alcohol, whatever, and you put your uniform on, you're back to holiness again. Yep. And um, I remember you saying about Levi Price, you know, he was, you know, he's all in all this stuff about, you know, putting the flesh down and whatever else. And he was, you know, guilty of fornication. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Uh, he slept with his roommate, you know, and then uh, he had a girl. That's one thing you don't do as a Christian man. Never, ever room with a female that you're not married to. That's a terrible idea. Um, you know, he had this roommate come live with him. And guess what? One thing led to another and it led to another. And then pretty much we all figured out, yeah, they were doing stuff together because I mean, in his videos, he was all flirty and stuff with her on the streets up there where he lived at. You could see it in the videos and we were just like, yep, this guy's a pervert. You know, I just knew it right then. The guy's a pervert, you know, and he was just all about, he was just all about, um, you know, a lot of his stuff had to do with fornication, cutting off your penis he actually had a video about burning himself, you know, where he actually tried to do it. You know, he said he did. I don't believe it for two seconds. I think he's faking the whole thing. Um, and he had a video about, you know, cut off your, you know, penis to live holy for God, you know. <laughs> what a weirdo, you know. But, um, but yeah, getting back to the sinless perfection thing, Levi Price was not a sinless perfectionist, but, you know, he pretty much implied that the whole time, you know. Um he would say, well, we can't be sinless, but yet we need to be sinless. You know, it's a contradiction, pretty much. Um, so, yeah, getting back to the eternal security thing, what is the issue here? What is the issue with the whole eternal security thing? Well, the issue is sin. How many sins can you do before you lose your salvation? That's the issue here. Well, I'm going to tell you none. All right. There's four verses in the New Testament, okay, that these guys will, will not read at all. And I'm going to start with... Uh, Acts thirteen thirty nine. You can go ahead and read it. Okay, that's fine. All right. Yep. It says, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. You're justified from all things? But I thought we could lose our salvation. Nope. Jesus Christ, his blood cleanses us from all sin. All right, next one. Okay, is Titus, actually uh, Colossians, I'm sorry. I'm trying to go in order here. Um, verse 13, for chapter 2, verse 13 says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, had he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all, some trespasses if you backslide. It's not what it says. It says you had forgiven you all trespasses. All. Um, next one. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. It says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. There it is again. All. And purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. All right, you see right there, all. And again, the last one is First John chapter 1, verse 7. We already covered it. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, we're going to look at the two verses they use to say, well, the blood of Jesus doesn't cleanse you from all sins. Okay? I'm going to show you those. And it's Romans chapter 3. Here's one they like to quote and say, well, the blood doesn't cleanse all sin. Okay, we'll see about that. All right, it's verse 25. Okay, it says whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness from the remission of sins that are that are past through the forbearance of God. See, only the past sins are forgiven. That's what they try to use right there. Hmm. <laughs> you know, it's not at all what it's saying, you hmm. know, it's saying that you know, your only your sins are past. That's not what it's saying, you know ridiculous and uh the next one that they'll try to use is this one right here uh it's second peter chapter one and we'll start in verse eight go ahead it says for these things be in you and uh, and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren 
nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and had forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. See, they'll see right here. Only your old sins are forgiven. You know, that's what they try to use. Ridiculous, isn't it? You know. Yeah, yeah but well, scriptures are about the, the point of salvation. You know, yeah. Saved, your sins are forgiven in the past, but the blood's there. It's, you know, the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ comes and your future sins are forgiven as well. It's like, okay, if only your past sins are forgiven by those two verses, what do you do with the other four verses I just quoted? You know, mm -hmm. all... You know, past, present, future. So that's really the issue here. They'll say only the blood cleanses you from your past sins. Well, if that's the case, then let's just go get the booze. Let's go party because what's the point? What is the point at that point? You know, because you can't save yourself, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're a sinner, you know. Um, that's what uh, Eric John Phelps says a lot. He says, you know, if we can lose our salvation, then what's the use, you know? What is the use of even trying? You know, I might as well just throw all this stuff away, you know, and just live it up until it's time for me to go. And I'll go home to hell and take it like a man. You know, if Jesus Christ did not pay for all of our sins, then what's the point? And what's the point of even us trying? You know, and that's the thing. We'll get this thing put on us that we're Lordship Salvation people because we say that the Holy Spirit comes in and regenerates us at salvation. We're born again. You know, we, have in, we walk in newness of life. But yet, there's this movement out here on the streets that's way more dangerous than anything. And a lot of a lot of movements out there. And nothing's being said about them. They're quietly going on the radar. Nothing's being said about them. No one's making a mention of them, you know. And it's funny, you know. But, but yeah, getting back to the imputed righteousness of Christ. They don't believe in it for two seconds. Um, mm -hmm. Blood of Jesus Christ is the imputed righteousness, basically. Okay. Um, if you go to, I mean, Romans chapter four is a good one. Um, and, uh, and a lot of them will say, well, a lot of them will say, well, see salvation, you know, you can believe on Jesus Christ, but you have to have works or if you're, you're then you're not saved. And they'll quote James chapter two, which, I mean, if you read James chapter two, it completely contradicts Ephesians chapter, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter two, where it says for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself. That's the thing. It says not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works. At least any man should boast. See what happens when you get saved by works. You can boast. You see, you can brag and say, look at me. Look at what I'm doing. You know, just like Satan, you know, I will ascend, you know, above the, you know, above the throne, you know, all that stuff. I will be like the most high. What are you doing? You're bragging at that point in time. Oh, you did that last week. Oh, you pitiful, you know, you pitiful creature. You, you know, they're Pharisees. That's what the whole thing's about. You know, um, they believe, they trust themselves to be righteous. And here's a great definition of a Pharisee, which is what these guys are. If you want to go to Luke 18 real quick. This is what I love right here. And they can't stand this for two seconds. You throw this in their face, they get all mad. Um, okay. It says, he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Again, what are they doing? They're trusting in themselves that they're righteous and they despise others. Very interesting, right? There's your definition of Pharisee right there. And, you know, and again, a Pharisee is not just a street preacher either. I mean, there are people that are self-righteous altogether that say I'm a good person. They're technically a Pharisee, you know. But um, if you actually read this right here, it says two men went up in the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with him himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off will not lift up so much of his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, you know, beating his chest, mm -hmm. saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased. He that humbled himself shall be exalted. See? What are these guys doing? Say, I can do this. I can ascend above the stars of God. You know? They're, bra they're bragging. You see? But he that humbles himself shall be exalted. You see the difference? A true believer realizes their state before God. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
a, a self-righteous Pharisee comes to God and says, I can be just like you. Mm -hmm. I can imitate yeah. you. If you. If you study the uh, uh, spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius de Loyola, the Jesuits, their handbook, that's exactly what they say. You come to the foot of the cross and you you visualize the sufferings of Christ and you say, how can I do this myself? Um, you know, it's they are imitation, you know, Christ is what the whole thing is. I mean, every Catholic priest out there is a, another Christ, according to the catechism. That's exactly right. Um, and what's interesting, too, these guys, they're these guys doctrine is Jesuitical, you know. Uh, we're going to get into another thing here in a minute, which is really blasphemous, okay? It's this thing where basically that God does not know the future. He's not all-knowing, okay? They basically say that God does not know the future. Therefore, he does not know what decisions you're going to make in the future. What? You know? Um, and they will use the thing with Abraham that says, you know, where, Abra where he was talking to Abraham and says, now I know, you know, now I know, you know what I'm saying here. They'll try to use that and try to say, well, see, God did not know what Abraham was going to do, you know. But yet you read uh, the Gospels. Jesus Christ knew what Judas Iscariot was going to do. He knew what Peter was going to do. And guess who Jesus Christ is, by the way? God the Father. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how did he know if, he, if he's not all knowing? You know? No. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things in the Old Testament that are written as typology of things that happen in the New Testament, you know. So, you know, they'll, they'll it's just, it, it's amazing how these people can cut up the scriptures. And, uh, you know, and I really do believe it's not just that they're doing it. I think it's that they're getting spiritual help. Yeah. The, the devils, in other words. Yeah. But, uh so we're which one are we on now we we went through kind of sinless perfection hypocrisy you know we don't really need to say much more on that i don't think but uh, the that kind of leads into the thing of the strife and contention that these yeah. guys get into and then that that sort of merits the thing of you know i mean kind of like the pharisees you know the pharisees would just follow jesus around all the time and we're just always bringing up and nitpicking every single little thing that he was doing and and making public scenes and you know trying to kill him and things you know different times they took up stones to stone jesus and he was jesus was getting out of there and and whatever else and you know again you're seeing the same thing with a lot of the street preaching movement there where they're they're going to the places where they know there's going to make they're going to make problems mm -hmm. and, you know and it's this thing of creating strife and contention and i believe and we've talked about this before i believe that it's actually on purpose. You know, the best example would be the Westboro Baptist, you know, system where they're, they're going to soldiers funerals and holding up, you know, God hates fags. God loves dead soldiers and stuff. They're purposefully doing that to give people a bad taste for Bible believing Christians. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Um, there was something I want to touch on real quick. Um, Matthew chapter 23, real quick. It says, um, All right, I'm going to read uh, uh, verse 23. It says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anus. I guess that's how you say that. Anus. It's what now? Anus. Ennis, okay. I never understood what that word said, but anyway. Um, and cumin and have omitted the, way, the weightier matters of the law and judgment, mercy and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Pretty much what they do, by the way. They'll nitpick at you all the time, you know. Um, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye may clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Yep. See, it's all about what is that right there saying? The outward ordinances, you know, but in, inwardly they're filthy. You're going to see that later on in this. Um, though thou blind Pharisee, clean, clean, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter that the outside of them may be clean also. 
Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye like unto whitest sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Like, exactly. That's the whole thing right here. They appear beautiful and righteous on the outside. See, look at me. I am reproving the world of sin and you know wickedness and stuff like that. But yet, what are they doing? You know, what are they? What's it? What are they really doing? They're promoting themselves. You know, and what? Are, what are they? They're full of dead men's bones. That's exactly what it is. You know, they sound good on the outside, but inwardly they're just dead. And um, for this whole sinless thing, you can't prove it from scripture. I mean, you can't. There's nowhere in Scripture that you can be sinless. And with a strife and contention thing going on, the Pharisees were were good at that, and they will and they were always picking at Jesus Christ, saying, "Why does this man sit with publicans and sinners? You know, why reason these things in your heart?" Jesus says, "You know, um, why? Because they were always trying to pick a fight with somebody. That's what they're doing. They're Pharisees. That's that's what the whole thing is." Um, mm -hmm. That's funny too, because uh, they're in Matthew chapter twenty three. Uh, let's see where's the verse at um, verse 15 well unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte and when he is made you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves mm -hmm. another good description of them yeah, yeah exactly I mean that's exactly what it is they, they go and get one guy you know and they convert him to their system guess what you just made another child of hell another twofold of the child of hell that's exactly what it is um, for these people out there to say, well, you know, well, sinless perfection, I mean, it can be achieved, really. Um, you know, real quick, I want to hit this first Kings chapter 8, verse 46. It says, If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, okay? Um, and thou be angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, so they so that they can carry them away captives into the land of the enemy far and near. I'm just going to touch on these real quick. And go through them real fast. Um, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 9 says, um, Who can say, I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. Who can say that? Only one person can say that is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, Psalms 130, verse 3 says, Actually, I'm in the wrong chapter here. 130 verse, not 103. If thou, Lord, should mark iniquity, O Lord, who shall stand? Which means that in the day of judgment, who shall be able to stand? Can you stand on your own? I don't nope. think. That's why, that's why Jesus Christ says, uh, you know, he was rebuking the uh, lukewarm church saying, but know thou are miserable wretched poor blind and naked okay without jesus christ's righteousness you are naked um all right one more to hit real quick ecclesiastes seven twenty. for there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not not a single one you know there's none righteous no not one of course Famous Romans chapter three, and of course First John chapter one verse eight says that you know if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Which is kind of funny too, because it says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. a real Christian understands they're a sinner. That's the whole thing here. So, right. But, um, but yeah, getting back to the strife and contention thing, these guys are always going out on the streets. They're wearing these bright yellow t-shirts. Most of them are. And they have like bright red and yellow flames all over them that say repent or perish, you know, you know, heaven or hell, whatever it is, you know, they'll have like hell right here. Jesus saves from hell, which is kind of funny. They say Jesus saves from hell, but really they're the ones saving themselves. You know, they'll have these things. Well, trust Jesus. How are you trusting Jesus if you're saving yourself? You know, so they contradict themselves all the time, you know. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I mean, like I said, they just go around to all these things. Like, they go to these big events. Um, they try to go to the biggest event possible to the place where there's going to be the most people watching. See? 
So that way they can get an audience and then they get media coverage. You say for being controversial, you know, why mm -hmm. there, there's an agenda here, obviously. Yep, absolutely. So uh, we'll go on to the next one. Non-dispensational. I think we've pretty much proved that one already. Just, you know, some <laughs> of the scriptures you've been going over. <laughs> so yeah. I've said too, but you know, I saw a, uh, Brother Jared said about Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 19. He said, could you go over that? Um, so we'll get there here. Yeah, absolutely. I've been doing talk. Well. Five. You want to read it? No, you go ahead. You've been, I haven't, I haven't said much. I've, I've said too much. Uh, that's all right. Verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But what's the kingdom of heaven? Chapter 11, verse uh, Matthew chapter 11, uh, verse 12. Verse 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. It's the physical kingdom on the earth that's coming. So you're reading in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, you're reading basically what's going to be going on in that millennial kingdom. So people that, that go in there and they steal things from you know the Sermon on the Mount, essentially, and try to apply to today, this Sermon on the Mount is... You know, laws that are going to be there under a military dictatorship with Jesus Christ running the thing and Satan bound in the bottomless pit. Yeah. I don't think we have that situation right now. Yeah. Uh, work. And not so, to mention, you know, the curse is going to be lifted from the earth during that time as well. Right. So keeping the commandments, you know, because in, in again, in the millennial kingdom, you can't have faith because mm -hmm. Jesus is physically on the earth. So how can there be faith? Right. And so, you know, again, and, you know, and it's so funny because they'll say, you know, well, you got to keep the commandments. You, but you don't, you know. No, I told for two seconds. Yeah. You know, um, the one of the, one of the favorite ones they love to quote is First John chapter two, verse three, where it says, if, you, if a man love me not or love, or let me go there real quick. Um, this is one they love. I'm thinking the one in John chapter 14, but yeah, this one here as well. It says first John chapter two, verse three says hereby. We do know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. They'll say, see right here. You got to keep the commandments. Well, again, is this written to a Christian today? Exactly. No, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, um, Paul is our apostle to the Gentiles. Okay. Not John. Instruction of righteousness is definitely there. You could say, well, this is a test for, you know, for somebody that's a Christian. If they're, you know, obeying, you know, living and walking in newness of life, examining themselves and stuff like that. Well, you kind of have a problem here. This goes back to the James chapter two thing, because it says right here, he that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Do you keep all the commandments perfectly? You know? Yeah. You know, so exactly. Um, so, no, I mean, that's that's ridiculous. And uh, the other one they love to go to is this one right here. John chapter 14. I believe it's this one right here. Verse 15. Okay. Yeah. If you love me, keep my commandments. You know. Yep. John 14, 15, yep. Um, another one I love the quote. It's the very next chapter over. Uh, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it might bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean the, through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, 
the same bringing forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. It's funny. They don't even read that part right there. Um, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and man gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. So again, is this talking about somebody losing their salvation? Of course not. You know, I mean, this is talking about abiding in Christ. You know, people say, well, you got to abide in Christ. You know, you got to walk, you know, according to him. You say you got to walk according to him. You got to obey what he does. You know, you got to be Christ-like. You ever heard that term before? You got to be Christ-like. Mm -hmm. They'll put that on you a lot. You got to be Christ-like. And they'll use this right here, First John chapter, or First John 15, whatever. John 15. <laughs> yeah, I'm not infallible at all. Um, Keep you know. trying. You know, it's about, it's, it's about the journey to infallibility, okay? Yeah, exactly, you know. <sighs> but I, I got myself all mixed up on that one. But, um, but yeah, they'll, they'll use one right here. See, it says right here, if you abide in me, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth, cast forth as a branch is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Okay, if you're lost, do you abide in Christ? No, obviously, you know. But if you're in Christ, you abide in him. Yeah, obviously. Is it talking about work salvation here? No. Of course not john you know i've always said this a long time you know john is a transitional book you know i believe john is going from law to grace it's like a transition from the law to grace you know is the way i've always read it you know um because you'll see things that mirror the church age in in here like john chapter six you know here's one right here they will not quote for two seconds actually john chapter five verse 24 it says verily verily i say unto you he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me Huh? You got to believe on him that sent me? God the Father? Yep. Had everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You got to believe on him that sent me. What? <laughs> oh, it pretty much throws out the whole trendy thing. Um, you know, because, you know, Isaiah 43 11 says, you know, there is no other God beside me, and beside me there is no Savior. You know? Um, Talking about God the Father. Fairly, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, lowercase w, believeth on him that sent me, and believeth on him that sent me, had everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation. You see that? You will not come into condemnation if you believe on God the Father. That's what it says. Uh -huh. You know? But it's passed from death unto life. You know? See, that's the thing. They don't even believe that Jesus Christ is God the Father either. I want to I want to mention that too. There a lot of them deny Jesus Christ is even God at all. Okay. Um, they'll say, well, Jesus Christ was a lesser, you know, he was a created God. I've heard some of them say that, you know, which is very, 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 very weird, you know. Um John chapter six, real quick, says uh, in verse thirty five, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So if you come to Jesus Christ, you will not be cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which had sent me, that all the, of all which had he given me, I shall lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day. What? Jesus Christ will lose nothing? That's right. If you're born again and part of the body of Christ, you will not be lost. Yeah. That's, I talked to an Amish guy the one time, actually here in Maine, one of the Amish settlements out in Smyrna. And uh, I, I quoted the thing about, you know, no man can pluck them out of my father's hand. And he said, Yes, but he said that's saying no man can do it, but you can do it to yourself. Yes, I've heard that one before too. <laughs> Take that. Okay. Sure. But finally, let's go to the last point here. Um, they're not King James Bible believers. No. Um, I was kind of shocked by that because I, you know, I thought I've heard a lot of them, they'll quote the King James Bible, but I saw some uh, 
uh, street preaching conference thing years ago, and I was watching some of these wing nuts, and and uh, the one guy, you know, was using the, I think it was the New King James version or something, and he he was ripping on Bible believing Christians, you know, King James Bible believers. He's cutting on the King James Bible, and I thought, what, you know, a street preacher, you know, cutting on the King James Bible was kind of weird. So, and again, you know, I've heard, I've heard them too, and they'll use Greek. They'll bring up, well, the Greek word here means, you know, they'll, they'll do that whole thing too. So. Yeah, they do. Um, here's one of their favorite books right here that they love. This is one of the most popular among the street preachers, New King James Version. Um, this is also another one that's pretty popular. Uh, this is the New Living Translation. I finally got my hands on one. Um mm. And this thing is so this thing is so blasphemous and vile. Um, basically, this thing pretty much twists everything that has to do with faith and turns it into works. Um, and this one right here, this is another common one among the street preachers. The extremely stupid version, or I, as I like to say, the extremely satanic version. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is a verse they'll quote when they use the ESV. I'm going to show you this real quick. I'm going to show you how they butcher... Um, Okay, turn to your King James Bible on John three thirty six. I'm gonna show you what they. I'm gonna show you how this this book butchers that verse. But see, if you're a street preacher, it's okay, and we're gonna see why here in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Obeys the Son? I thought it was belief. Yep. Um, just, right. to read it the, just to read it the right way here, I'll do it quick. Um, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Yep, it's belief, not obey. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go over a few verses of the, that the, a lot of street preachers will quote from the ESV, which is, the I think, the most popular out of all of them. Um. First Corinthians chapter one. Yep. I think you know where I'm going with this one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me get there real quick. This thing is so hard to follow. It's like <laughs> it's not simple like a King James Bible is. Okay. First Corinthians one eighteen. Yeah, eighteen. I can't find it on oh here we go. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved it is the power of God, for it is written. Mm -hmm. Being saved. Mm -hmm. King James Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Yep. Amen. Yep. Are saved. Are saved. I got another one for you. Um, it's in Hebrews. I mean, but again, it's still it's still bad. This is one that I like to use. It's Hebrews ten fourteen. Okay. Uh, no, actually, I'm sorry. It's uh, thirteen. It says, um, "Waiting for from that time until his enemies should be made his footstool, for by a sing, single offering has he he has perf I can't even follow this thing. It's so ridiculous." For my offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Yep. You know, I mean, again, I understand this is for the book of Hebrews, but the uh, King James says are sanctified, not mm -hmm. being sanctified. Um, let's see here. Let me read the right one real quick. Go for it. Uh, verse 13 and 14. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Yep. Yeah. Um, here's another one they'll quote right here. It's uh, Hebrews 12, 14. Okay. All right. It says, strive for peace with everyone, for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See, they'll say right here, see, you, if you're not living holy... You will not see the Lord. What's the King James say? Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. 
you see how the whole thing is just twisted, you know? And you yep. see how you can make this into work salvation out of the ESV easily. Um, mm -hmm. See, I'm trying to think. There's one more. Oh, yeah. First Corinthians chapter 11. All right. Yep. ESV reads, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Yep. Imitation Christ. Uh, there's one more real quick. Uh, it's in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter five. This thing's so ridiculous. Okay. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Imitators of God. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. Exactly. Um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, the eternal security passage. Mm -hmm. All right. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom ye were sealed for the day of redemption. See? Past tense. Mm -hmm. King James Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Not ye were sealed. See how they right. use ESV? This is, a, this is a Catholic Bible right here. This is for papists. Okay? You see how the whole thing is twisted around to where it's all past tense? You know? I mean, there's a lot more I could go over here. I mean, I'm just hitting the surface on this whole thing. But, I mean, every one of these new verses... Say this almost basically the same thing, okay? NIV, New King James, all of them. I mean, there ain't no difference, you know. They all say basically that it's all past tense, you know, you're being saved, you were sealed. See, if you grieve the Holy Spirit of God, you lose your salvation, you're not gonna be sealed anymore, you know. Uh, but God can lie, you know, when He promised. See, yep, that's the whole thing here, too. You know, they just call God a liar, you know, and. And frankly, we uh, we we just touched the surface on on all this on the, all our teachings. If I really wanted to hit it hard, it'd probably take me up to three hours. If I really want to just hit it hard, but I mean, you can pretty much tell right here this whole thing is wicked just by us talking here. I mean, you know, eternal security is Ephesians one fourteen one thirteen one fourteen. Obviously, you're sealed until the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit of promise. Tie that in Ephesians four thirty. First Second Corinthians one twenty two says you're sealed. Okay, um, of course, John chapter 6, 37 through 39 says you are you will not be cast out and God shall lose nothing on the day of redemption. Okay, uh, John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28 says my sheep know my voice. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life that they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And it goes on to say my father is greater than all and no man shall be able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. So, you know, those those verses right there. I mean, there's a lot I could cover on that whole thing. You know, there's First Peter chapter. My favorite right here, if you really want to pin these papists to the wall, check out this right here. This right here just throws them a, throws them a flip. First uh, Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read in the King James this time. Um. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and according to his abundant mercy, have begotten us again unto a lively hope by the assurance of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You want to talk about some powerful verses? Those right there are amazing. Mm -hmm. What verse was that? It's First Peter chapter one. First what? Uh, three through five. Okay. I'm just reading in another version here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I gotta. That's that's. Eh, I won't go on that one. But I got to read uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 from my uh, new version here. Um, Ephesians 4, verse 30. I don't know if I can pronounce this word. And contrastrate 
not the Holy Spirit of God, in which you are signed unto the day of redemption. What? The <laughs> contra straight. What are you reading? The Dewey Reams? Yep. How did I know? 1582. Jesuit Bible. <laughs> so, contra straight. Is that, you know, one verse in there was talking about, you know, Jesus Christ said it's finished. You know, uh, mm -hmm. it says it is like what consummate or something like that. Something weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, in the, in the late 1800s, it was called the, um, uh, oh, the Challoner revision. They actually revised the Reams, the Dewey Reams Bible to make it sound more like the King James Bible because, Nobody paid any attention to the Dewey Reams Bible. It was just, I guess not. You know, nobody cared about it, so they they had to revise it to make it sound like the King James. Kind of funny. I told us I told a pre-Vatican II Catholic the one time that because I said, "What's the Bible? What's the perfect Word of God?" And he said, "The Dewey Reams." I said, "You mean the the old one or the Challoner revision?" What? No, <laughs> he <had> no idea. <laughs> I got him all messed up, and he was. I didn't know that. Yeah, but well, let's finish up here by naming some names. We've okay. already been naming a bunch of them, but uh, I think the Westboro Baptist Church thing is kind of petered out a little bit, hasn't it? I mean, I don't really hear much about them anymore. Yeah, they're 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 nowhere to be found, really. I mean, uh, they kind of lost their edge. There's this new movement now, you know. But I'm gonna name some names. Uh, there's the uh, Spokane Street Preachers with Eddie Cranky. Um, he's the ringleader up there. Um, there is, of course, Reuben Israel and his, his, you know, his drones, um, with, he runs around with, uh, that little kid, uh, Dean Saxton. Um, um, I'm gonna get to that. Hold on. Um, and then, uh, he's big, he's big buddies with Jesse Morale. Um, he's also, uh, they're also big buddies with this guy named John McGlone. He's a weirdo, just, just disgusting old man. And the, the biggest leader of them all is Jed Smock. And I'm going to show you this picture right quick. Actually, I'll do it right here. because This is a bigger screen because I can't Let's see here. Check this out. You want to tell me that this guy's a Christian? Here you go. There's Mr. Uh, there's Mr. Smock right there. Look at that. Look at that crucifix. Look at those. He looks like Kenneth Copeland. Mm -hmm. You know, is a crucifix a Christian symbol? Should that so is that something we should be carrying around? Absolutely not. Um. You know, I mean, basically what the crucifix teaches is that Jesus Christ is continuing to suffer. That's what it teaches. I mean, I mean, again, what do the street preachers teach? They, they have to continue to crucify Jesus Christ on a daily basis, you know, by their their continual repentance and forgiveness of sin, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, they're basically crucifying Jesus Christ over and over again every day. You know, they die daily, as they call it, you know. Yeah, sure. Sure you do. Um and uh, I want to touch on something else while we're talking about these guys. Another thing they're big on is dreams and visions. Um, you know, they're big on the whole, you know, going to you know, going to hell and coming back type thing. I actually did a video on uh, Adam from Team Jesus Preachers. It's been over a year ago that I did that. And uh, the guy talked about being in a glass box in hell and stuff like that, chained up. You know, and it's funny. Brother Tim said, uh, I didn't realize God needed an elevator. You know, <laughs> you know, but yeah, I mean, they believe in dreams and visions that you can go to hell and come back. Nobody in scripture has gone to hell and come back. Not one. The only person that ever did was Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's God. That's why you're not. Yeah. You know? And, and, you know, it's the same thing with the, uh, the Jesuit, you know, the spiritual exercises. That's the whole point. You go into a trance, you go through all this suffering and everything else. And then you go into a trance and you have visions. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the whole deal. You think about that, you know, 
when you do these spiritual exercises, you can go into trances. I didn't even realize that. Oh yeah. That's part of the, uh, if you go to an Ignatian retreat, um, it's kind of interesting because they actually have different levels of suffering that you can do where you're, where you'll go into fasting and you'll get on your knees and just stay on your knees. And you know, then as pain comes in and everything else and, um, you know, the, the retreat, the, the, the one that's running the retreat is supposed to monitor people's health. And if it's actually starting to become a danger to their health, they, they have to pull them out of it and whatever else. But yeah, they, they actually go into the thing of ecstatic experience and getting into the touch with the spirit realm and whatever else. And if you see that somebody is not, um, you know, capable of getting into the higher levels, then you just lie to them. Basically and you tell them, You've achieved the highest level. Congratulations. Go away now. And uh, but the the retreatant that is able to get into really deep trance, um, you know, they're the ones that will go into the real high up experiences. I mean, you look at the life of Ignatius, you know, himself, De Loyola, he was going into all kinds of weird, you know, uh, seeing visions and all kinds of stuff. And that's actually one of the the things of to be beatified as a Catholic saint, you have to have actually had an ecstatic experience. You have to see saints or, or some angels or something like that. And um, again, Ignatius de Loyola, if you study the guy's life, he was, he'd have these ecstatic experiences. And then he was a deranged sex pervert. A lot of times he was a womanizer, mm -hmm. you know, and so just, again, it's such a parallel with the whole street preaching movement, you know, oh, they're having all these experiences and these wild dreams and, and then they sin, but it's not really a sin, you know, and, you know, and they're, it's just, it's crazy. The parallels between the two groups. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, it's funny, both groups teach that you can be your own God, you know, mm -hmm. essentially, you know. I mean, these sinless perfection wing nuts basically say that they're that they've been restored to, you know, their pre sinful state to the, you know, before Adam and Eve. They don't develop a sin nature until they get older. You make the choice to sin, you see. And uh, Charles G. Finney was the uh, father of that movement. You know, he's the one that came up with that whole thing. It's called decisionism. That your decisions are your decisions determine your eternity. You know, and. It's not about Jesus Christ and his righteousness. No, it's about what you do and your decisions, you know. And again, what's this doing? It's basically just a, a, a you know, like I said, a ascended masters type thing where you just basically become your own God. That's what it is. You become an ascended master, essentially. You know, I don't know if you guys know what the ascended masters are, but they believe they can become an ascended master. That's what they believe. You know, basically your own God. So... So yeah, I mean, it ties in perfectly. When I, Brian, when I heard your uh, Ignatius video for the first time, I was sitting there listening to this thing, and I was like, are you kidding me? You know, I was like, wow. It's funny. They they pretty much believe what the catechism teaches, but yet now, now I'm getting this thing where, okay, now they're also doing things that are Jesuitical on top of it, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it's just crazy. <laughs> that the whole thing works out. Yeah. And the thing with the Jesuits that you have to remember is the Jesuits, you know, Ignatius de Loyola was a military commander. And um, when he was injured, he got hit in the leg by, by a cannonball. That's got to hurt. But, uh, you know, he he was he was military and he basically said, you know, I want to make a order of Roman Catholic, you know, monks slash priests that are soldiers, secret soldiers for the Vatican. So there's a there's a sense in which this whole street preaching thing you'll see them talking about. I've seen some of their videos where they're talking about we're we're an army, we're kind of a they they get into this fighting, we're a military for Jesus Christ type of a deal. We're going to go out and fight sin on the streets and take on the sinners and and whatever else. It's exactly what they're doing. Same thing as the Jesuit order. Yep. You know, it's funny, too, when you talk about, you know, let's go fight sin in the streets and let's go rebuke sinners. They will actually use this verse right here to condemn people that don't do that. Um, I think you have an idea where I'm going with this, but I'm going to read it anyway. They're hyper soul winners. Um, that's another thing, too. If you're not out preaching the gospel to somebody, if you're hiding the gospel, then you're going to be tormented for that. 
you know, and all this garbage. Um, Ezekiel 33. Mm -hmm. I think you know where I'm going with this. Yep. Uh, Ezekiel 33, 8. It says, When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou does not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I acquire at thine hand. See, they'll they'll put these little memes up on Facebook and say, uh, they'll have like a picture of like bloody hands on there. It says, warn them. And they'll quote Ezekiel 38. You know, your blood will be on their hand. Your, their blood will be on your hands if you don't go witness to them, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, who's it speaking to? You know, Israel, you know. Um, um, one more that they like to quote real quick. And, and I got to just interject here too, because the Baptists will do the exact same thing. They might not do the, the you know, rejecting eternal security. They might be dispensational. They might whatever, whatever. But a lot of the Baptists I've been around then the IFB guys and stuff, they'll get real militant. If you're not warning the wicked, you know, you're got, you got their blood on your hands. They'll use the exact same passage of scripture to guilt trip you. For not yep. going out street preaching or soul winning or the whole deal. Yep. Yep, exactly. The same thing. Uh, one more verse they'd like to use to refute eternal security. I forgot. I completely forgot about it. It's Hosea 4, 6. It says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because thou has rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no more, no priest to me. Seeing thou has forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forgot, forget thy children. I mean, again, this is Old Testament under the law. It has nothing to do with a Christian today. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, this is just stupid, nutty nonsense at this point, you know. And they'll do this, too. They'll go back in the Old Testament. They will find verses that talk about stuff like this. You know, Jeremiah 40, 32, I believe it is, where it says, you know, um, I will put my fear in their hearts. They will not depart from me. You know, they will use stuff like that and say, you know, you should be fearing God and fearing that he can send you to hell at any minute, you know. If you uh if you're afraid that God's gonna send you to hell in a minute, you might want to check and see if you're even saved. You know, you might want to check and see what God you're serving there. It sounds like you're serving God, the God of Allah, to me, because I mean that's ba that's basically what Allah believes. You know, so, but yeah, you know, um, getting back to these guys, these these nuts, um. They're big on these dreams and visions things. And there's one guy that's actually not a street preacher, but he follows these guys. They're, they're buddies. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever heard of uh, Jan Boshoff, Final Call 07. Mm -hmm. um, he actually rejects the Bible altogether, you know, and says that Jesus Christ is the word. Okay, well, where's your proof? Okay, if you have no written authority, then you have no standard. You know, you just make up a God in your imagination, you know. You know, oh, but God talks to me every day. Sure he does. The devil's in your head talk to you. Because in Jan Boshoff's another nut that said he's been to hell and he came back. So I just want to throw that out there. Anybody has said they have been to hell and they have seen visions of Jesus Christ or anything like that, they are lying to you and they are on their way to hell. I mean, they are not saved. You're dealing with false prophets and they are coming to try to trip you up and try to scare you. You have these people that, you know, uh, there's this... Uh, and uh, Zambrano girl, you know, they're the street preachers are big on this girl. There's that uh, Angelica, I think her name is Angelica Zambrano or whatever her name is. And, uh, you know, she was big on, um, you know, like she would go to hell and she said, I seen many people down there. I've seen a Pope. I've seen many music stars. Um, I've seen, you know, my grandmother down there. And she would go on to say, like, well, and here's another one too they'll put on you. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven type stuff. I'm about to cover that one here in a minute. Um, my grandmother is down here. I don't think she ever knew you, Lord. You know, I'm trying to remember how it goes, but um, it goes, daughter, I, she is here because she failed to forgive. And many people were here because they failed to forgive as well. You know, so Jesus Christ is, you know, saying that if you don't forgive, you won't, you know, you won't be saved basically. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you, do you know who I'm talking about though? This Zim Brown girl. I think isn't she the one that she died or something for a while supposedly? Yes, she was. Uh, her whole family's charismatic. Yeah, yeah. You I know? think I did. I think I talked about her with the near death experience study I did years ago. 
You may have. Uh, I don't remember. I remember you talked to somebody about that, but uh, yeah. but yeah, she's one of the big popular ones out there. Um, and there's this other, there's this channel out there called uh, Divine Revelation um, or something like that. And their their whole their whole channel is dedicated to just doing dreams and visions, and uh, you know, and everybody that comes back from these dreams and visions all teach a false gospel of sinless perfection. Every one of them, you got to be perfectly sinless, you know. And I, and I find it funny a lot of it's women, you know. You know, kind of funny the Bible talks about this right here. I'm gonna show you this. Um, it's in Timothy. Real quick. Second Timothy chapter three. Um, I'm gonna read the whole thing right here. Uh, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Oh, we're definitely not there, are we? No. Um, <laughs> for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Pretty much describes the street preachers right there in one verse. All those sins. Mm -hmm. um, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Pretty much describes your whole street preaching movement right there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, check this out. It says, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. There you go. Silly women led away in diverse lusts. It's not talking about just, you know, outward ordinances. It's also talking about just like, you know, heresies. Heresy can be a lust. You know, you can lust after heresies, you know, and lust after false teachings. I mean, it's not just like sex. People always like to quote, put lust with just sex you know right you know you can covet you know false teachers you can covet you know those kind of things lust after money lust after power lust after fame yeah, yeah. absolutely so you know so yeah i mean that's what they're doing and I, I find it funny a lot of these dreams and visions have to do with women you know and that verse right there tells me that they're they're being led captive. Silly women are being led captive, laid with sins. Yeah, we're definitely seeing that for sure. You know, you yeah. get, a, get a naive woman led away by a false prophet. There you go. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing on this passage here, the thing of, you know, fierce and and uh, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. You know, another thing I've seen is the thing of, the a lot of these street preachers that get into confrontations all the time with the police officers and a lot of times the police are being trying to be nice about it and trying to say look you know i remember this one guy these guys are out there and they're saying you know uh holding up signs about fags and whatever else and you know fags and then the big red circle with the line through it you know and and uh, this police officer was saying, look, all you're trying to do is just tick these people off with this, you know, gay rally thing over here. You're just trying to make them mad. And you can quote scripture. You can read from the Bible. But he said, you're just over here calling up, yelling about fags and stuff. And and the guys, you know, yelling back at this cop, you know, you don't have a right to tell me what to do. I have a First Amendment right, blah, 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 blah. And you could see the cop was saying, look. You know, you can preach the Bible, but you can't be doing this just inciting to riot, you know, is, is the criminal thing there. And, you know, I've seen that thing so many times with these, these street preacher guys when they get into confrontations with the police. The police are saying, I'm not against you preaching the Bible, but you're you're going beyond that. Yeah, and they are. That's again, it's it's why I believe that they're not they're not even just ignorant. I think that it is a actual group of people that are being sent out to demonize Christians to make us look bad, you know, and it's and you're right. Absolutely right. What you said earlier that there's very few people that are even standing against this whole thing, this whole movement, you know, which is a shame. You know, I mean, it's funny where, you know, uh, there's a lot of, you know, 
people that just turn against us and stuff like that. And they'll sit there and call us Lordship Salvation and stuff like that. But yeah, have you actually paid attention to the street preaching movement? Maybe you should go watch them sometimes and be disgusted by them. You know, you want to see some rotten, filthy stuff. Go watch them. You know, they are some of the most disgusting things in the world. And you guys know me. I give a lot of grace to people. You know, it's like with, um, you know, you come to me and stuff like that and you got a problem. Am I just going to throw you under the bus and say, you know, you're going to hell and stuff like that? Because that's exactly what the street preachers will do. They'll sit there and you got a problem with uh, your marriage or something like that. You know, I had a sister one time tell me she had a husband that's lost, you know, and I don't know what to do about it, you know, and stuff like that. You know, and I'll just talk to her about it and ask her, you know, are you prepared to leave? You know, if that time comes and she says, well, you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to. And I was like, yeah, you are. I was like, you know, the Bible says depart from iniquity, you know, touch not the unclean thing. If he's not repented, he's not repenting. You have a right to leave him. You know, you are God's, you know, you're God's property. You're his temple. And God does not want your his temple to be abused in any way. You know, and when you put yourself in that situation, you are abusing God's temple because you're sitting there saying, you know, I have to sit here and suffer. I have to stand for this. No, you don't. No, you're going to end up you're going to end up in a premature death is what you're going to do. And uh, because you're and in my opinion, I believe people that do this stuff that, you know, that they go this they go this extra mile and say you got to stand for these marriages. I believe they are idolaters. I really do. Because at that point, you're not just loving God anymore. You're just loving this marriage and trying to think, oh, I'm only way I'm going to be right with God if I stand for this. No, mm -hmm. uh -uh. no, that's the worst thing you can do. But anyway, my yeah. point is, is that, um, you know, I don't sit here and throw you under the bus because you have a problem. You know, you come to me about a personal issue. I'm not going to sit here and just throw you under the bus. But, you know, if you come to me and tell me that you reject the King James Bible, I'm going to reprove you, you know you know, twice. And if you refuse to listen, well, I can't fellowship with you. That's different. You know, that's not the same thing. I can't fellowship with a new versionist. I can't because we're not going to be on the same page. Your, your versions are so corrupt and so deceiving that they're not even going to line up with what I believe, you know? So, and what the Bible actually teaches, by the way. Um, but anyway, you know, getting back to what I was saying, it's different between coming to me with a heresy. You know, if you're if you're confused about something, that's one thing. If you come to me and tell me that I'm wrong in a certain area when I know what the Bible says, no, I don't think so. That's different. But if you come to me and say I'm struggling with the preacher of rapture, okay, fine, I'll help you out with that. Brian will help you out with that. I mean, I'll be more than happy to listen to you. You know, I'm struggling on the Trinity versus Godhead thing. Help me out. I'll talk with you. I've done it many times with many people. You know. Um, if you're struggling, I, 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 have, I, have, I, have, I mean, I have years where I should have people open given time to change of what they're doing. You know, they don't change, unfortunately. Um, you know, and again, people, and then they see me rebuke somebody and they go, that's all he does is just expose people. No one, no one is it, you know, but yeah, you know, but again, getting back to the street preaching thing, I, exactly what you're saying, you know, if you're not in their crowd, they'll rebuke you and, you know, I mean, you're just not anywhere close to their level of holiness and, and the whole deal. Yep. 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 Excellent. Absolutely true. You know, I mean, um, but again, you know, I've talked about like the uh, the different names and stuff like that. So, I mean, the big name ones, you know, the ones I've mentioned, those are the ones you need really need to watch out for. Um, I mean, again, you got anybody come to you with a dream or a vision from that supposedly from Jesus Christ, you've been to heaven or hell, uh, get away from them. They're liars. If you got anybody telling you that eternal security is wrong, get away from them. They're liars. Anybody that teaches against eternal security denies Jesus Christ. They deny what he did on the cross. Plain and simple. There's no if ands or buts about it um you know if you come to some if you got somebody telling you to stop sinning that you go you, you should go and sin no more and live holy to be saved get away from them they're lost they're trying to they're trying to merit their own salvation that's pretty much what it boils down to um so uh, and again you know and this this movement's very popular this whole this whole eternal security denial you know joe shimmel is one of these one of these guys is a big pusher of it um, 
you know, he's a papist. Uh, I've exposed him before. Um, he's that guy. He has the, uh, uh, I forgot what the chant, the thing is called good fight ministries. He does a lot of videos on these uh, Hollywood celebrities and he's going around to people on the streets and asking them, can you find me one verses, one scripture that says pre-trib rapture, you know, and I'm just like, okay, show me one verse of scripture that says post-trib rapture, you know, wow. he won't do it for two seconds, you know? Yeah. Another, another guy involved in the whole kind of street evangelism type of deal is Ray Comfort. And he gets into the whole thing of the, you know, the holiness and, and, uh, obedience and all that other stuff. Yeah. He's a little bit more confusing. You know, he's, I don't think I know where he stands at because one minute he'll say you're eternally secure, but he says, you got to stop doing this and stop doing that. So it's just like, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't quite understand him. You know, I've watched some of his movies they are, they're decent, you know, like his answers to atheists and stuff like that. He does some, he does a good job on all that, but you know, he actually talks about the Bible, you know, and like he talks about what you have to do to be saved and stuff like that. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, there's this thing where you have to stop doing this and stop doing that. And I'm just like, uh -huh. You're confusing people. Years ago, he started out. I think he was fairly, you know, okay. The problem is, though, I mean, he actually made his own edition of the King James Bible, where he changed a lot of the words of it. I, I forget what the thing's called, but uh, he made his own Bible, which is I have a big problem with that. But um, uh, the street preacher I mentioned at the beginning that I that I met and I talked with him a little bit, James Lyman. He actually met Ray Comfort and talked to him in person and um and he said to him you know why don't you believe the king james bible or do you believe the king james bible and he said no he said i never will be you know king james only or whatever so yeah, ray comfort uh he he is a lot more deceptive um but he'll get into the thing of you have to live a life of holiness and and all this other stuff and he'll he'll he's very forked tongued you know, he'll he'll sound really good sometimes, but then other times he just throws total heresy into things. So, so I just wanted to mention Ray Comfort as a dangerous guy. You don't really want to mess with him. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's funny about him, too. He'll say that you must obey the laws of the land in Romans 13, you know. So um, he says anybody that doesn't have a marriage license is not right with God. So I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> Um, I've heard him say that before, but, um, that's another thing too, you know, this, um, the street preaching movement too, they're pacifists. I want to throw that one out there too. Um, they are big time pacifists. And, uh, if you get punched in the face or something like that, they won't retaliate on you or, you know, like, let me take that back. If you punch them in the face, you know, or somebody walks up and punches them in the face or beats the crap out of them, they won't retaliate. They'll just take you to court and sue you, you know? pretty much um <laughs> but they'll tell you that if you get if you if someone's threatening you and stuff like that you need to just back down get on your knees and rebuke their devils pretty much you know is which is re retarded you know I, if somebody comes to my house and you know i'm not gonna sit there and rebuke their devils i'm gonna probably have a baseball bat waiting for them or something you know <laughs> i'm not gonna let them sit there and uh you know do harm to my family i don't think so you know mm -hmm. um I saw this dumb clip from uh, that movie War Room, you know, where this woman was rebuking this robber, getting ready to shoot her, and she said, stop in the name of Jesus. And I was like, woman, you do that in real life, you're going to get shot dead. You know? I was like, what a bunch of crap. Yeah. And they're, they're big on that whole thing, too, you know? Speak the devil's eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I found out the, I got to just tell the story yet, and, uh, but uh, there was a uh, thing in in Pennsylvania called Charity Ministries, and it was a lot of uh, Baptists. It was actually the Charity Ministries was founded by a a Jack Hiles uh, graduate um, named Denny Keniston. He was a Baptist preacher, and the other guy that founded it, I forget what his name was, but he was Amish. <laughs> so, <laughs> what a combination! But they get into the thing of street preaching and and whatever else, and they were pacifist with the whole thing and. And one of them said about, you know, that, that if he ever, um, you know, was had some guy holding a gunpoint, he said he would rebuke the bullet, you know. <laughs> and I found out later on um, 
that the Amish are into witchcraft, the powwowing, it's called Long Lost Friend is the name of the book. It was actually written by a Roman Catholic scholar many centuries ago. And, um, and I did a whole study on it, one of my Amish exposed studies, but they actually talked about stopping a bullet with, you know, spells essentially. So that's where the whole thing comes from. In other words, again, you know, you, you look at this thing of work salvation, it'll always go back to Roman Catholicism. It does. It really does. When I realized these guys were just believing or basically teaching Roman Catholicism, I was out. That was enough for me to say goodbye. You know, I've been taught my whole life Roman Catholicism is very wicked and we should have nothing to do with it. You know, and you know, whenever I was in high school and I heard somebody was a Roman Catholic and I would just be like, okay, you know, I didn't want anything to do with them. You know, even back then, you know, I just knew there was something. They were just, there was, there was always that spirit there. You know, this like this, this like, level of arrogance you know with these people and i never understood that but now now that i'm saved and i understand you know they're trying to become their own god that's what it boils down to you know they're just trying to be enlightened by themselves you know so now i totally get it why there's this level of arrogance and pride with these people and mm -hmm. it's the same street preachers and stuff like that i mean they're just they're just papists i mean that's all there is to it they're just street papists you know and uh and they'll get mad and stuff say we're not we're not catholics we rebuke catholics but yet you teach the same things that catholics do you know mm -hmm. yeah that's another thing it's funny i uh the thing of catholicism that the catholic church they'll the catholics will say we're the one church you know and and uh, we don't have the heresies the heretical splits like the protestants and whatever else and yet you look at them there's all kinds of sects within roman catholicism you know pre-vatican ii that that can't stand the modern catholics and all these other branches and sects of Catholicism. So it, it just, you know, the, the best thing, I think the conclusion of the matter here is just, you know, study the Bible. And, you know, when you understand the King James Bible and you can you spend some time studying what Roman Catholicism teaches um, and you understand the basic concepts of work, salvation, no eternal security, the pride thing of, I'm working my way to heaven. I'm going to imitate Jesus, whatever else. When you understand the basics of that, you'll see it in street preaching. You'll see it in the Amish. You'll see it in Roman Catholics. You'll see it with the Baptists. You'll see it. When you'll see it, you'll spot it. It doesn't matter what the name, the title is on it. You'll see those basic core things and you'll say, oh, there it is. And you'll run yeah. from it. Yep, exactly. You know, it's and it's funny too. We'll get this thing put on us that we're, you know, that we're holier than thou type people. I mean, that's not even, not even close. You know, I'm nowhere near holy on my own. And, you know, if I was, uh, it's funny. I heard Peter Rutman say one time, if, uh, you know, if I if God judged me now because of my thoughts, I go to hell like a bullet. You know, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. You know, because of, I'm wicked. You know, and I'm a dog, and I'm going to openly admit that. Big deal. Woo, I'm a dog. What are you going to do about it? You know, the black woman didn't do anything about it. She said, truth, Lord. You know, but yet the dogs eat crumbs from their master's table. You know, oh, that's so terrible, you know. So undermining the ego. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Your egotist egotistical maniacs is what you are, you know. So, you know, they can't admit that they're a dog for two seconds. If Jesus Christ came up to you in, in person and said, you're a dog, what are you going to do? You going to get offended or are you going to say truth, Lord? You know? And that's how you can tell someone's saved. I've used that a long time, you know. If somebody comes up to you and says, uh, you, you go up to them and say, if Jesus Christ told you, ask you if you're a dog. Sorry, my lights went. Okay. If Jesus Christ came up to you and said, asked you if you're a dog, what would you do? You'd be surprised how people got offended at that. Jesus Christ never told anybody that. <laughs> yeah, sure he did. You know, you know. So, just wanted to say that. Yeah. Well, I guess we should probably wrap this up. All right. Getting late here and everything, but uh, just hopefully this clears up some things about the street preaching movement. There's a whole lot more we could say on this, obviously. Yeah. Um, but you know, just, I hope this gives some of the brethren out there some, some grounding, how you can spot these papists, um, 
every Catholic will try to work their way to heaven. Mm -hmm. If you want to boil it down to the very simplest things, uh, thing out there, it's every Catholic believes that they can do something to earn salvation and they reject that they are a sinner. Like you said, brother, it's such a, such a good thing. Are you a dog? Yeah, I'm a dog. You know, I mean, if I've, I've said it many times in my sermons, if I ever get up there to heaven and the Lord says, you know what, we, you know, kind of put some names in a hat and we drew yours and we're going to judge you according to your works. I'm just going to say, Lord, just don't waste any time. Just point the way to hell and I'll go jump in. I'm not getting in by my works. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm just, there's no way I know what I'm, what, what my mind is. I know what sins I struggle with even today. And, and I'm just, I'm so wicked and, you know, the Lord saved me and, and it just, you know, when the Lord saves you and you understand the price that he paid, you know, you just think to yourself, there's just no way I can repay him. No. You know, I'm going to be grateful for the rest of eternity, you know, for him saving this worthless sinner here. And, you know, you see these people, be they the street preachers, the easy believism people, Roman Catholics, whatever else, they just will never get to that point. They don't yeah. struggle with sin. They don't struggle with this world. They aren't sick of this world. It's just, you know, what a miserable life they live. I mean, we go through life every day and we're just like, oh, is the rapture going to happen today? You know, I'm just tired of being here. You know, I look up to this guy all the time and I'm just waiting for those heavenly doors to open, you know, waiting for God to split the glass dome and say, come up hither, you know, come on, you know, but um, if you know what the glass dome is, uh, well, I'm sorry. Another uh, subject. <laughs> another subject. <laughs> but, um, but anyway. But yeah, you know, it's funny that we're sinners saved by grace, you know, and uh, and I get and we get looked at and we get we get looked at these uh people that are just like that have no grace for other people. I've given grace to other people, and you know, I'm not gonna give grace to somebody coming to me in their pride. The same with Jesus Christ; he's not gonna give grace to somebody that comes in their pride. God gives grace to the humble and rejects the proud. It's James four six. And you have to come to that point and realize that you're a sinner. You're no good. You're going to go to hell if you don't, if you don't ask God to save you. Plain and simple. I mean, just the way it is. Call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You know. Um, so, you know, if it was up to me, you know, I'd I'd be done for. And what's interesting too, you know, I'm even terrified of what's going to happen when I jump up there and I stand on the sea of glass for the first time. You know, and I stand before God and I'm like, um, I'm actually here, but for some reason I don't feel too good. You know? <laughs> you know, I'm like, um, yeah, I'm in the presence of the most holy, you know. So, yeah, I'm in the presence of God almighty and he's getting ready to judge my works. And uh, at the judgment seat of Christ, that's going to be a fearful thing. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, you better, you better think about that sometimes. And it's very, very sobering to think about. Um, yeah, I better think about this before I do this, you know, because he's going to judge my works and he's going to determine my place for eternity, you know, and, you know, if you're a Christian, you're naturally going to suffer. You don't want to worry about that, you know, Second mm -hmm. Timothy chapter two, you know, verse 11 through 13. Um, it's funny, they'll quote that too. And they'll say, if you deny him, he will deny us. They'll, they'll, they won't go on to the next verse. It says, but if we believe not yet, he abideth faithful. He he cannot deny himself. They won't quote the rest of it. You know, I forgot about that one. But, um, you know, it's a faithful saying. If we suffer, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he, shall, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And I don't have a Bible in front of me. I quote that off the top of my head. So, yep. uh, so that's one of my favorites. So absolutely, but yeah, we'll wrap it up here. Um, don't forget guys. Uh, we have that podcast on Saturday night with me and Tim. We're going to be doing science falsely. So called it's on Tim's channel. It, the, the, uh, it's, uh, his, uh, channel name is in my description on my channel. So if you want to find him, so, um, he likes to host them. So, but anyway, that's going to be it. Um, and also I'm going to be tying this transform wives, 
this is going to be kind of like a part two because this is something they're big on the street preachers are this no divorce thing which is very big in the catholic church i might add mm -hmm. they also use this no divorce thing as a blackmail thing so yep. you know about oh. that yeah, marriage is a sacrament in Roman Catholicism. It's one of the seven steps to get to heaven. You know, the the ladder that, that Mary provides to get to heaven. I mean, I literally have a picture of that in one of my catechisms. Right. The holy matrimony is one of the sacraments. So that's why it's so big and so important not to break it. Right. Yeah. Unless you're married, unless you're married to a Protestant, then it's actually you're you're not even legally married according to Catholicism. Right. I mean and the rules are for, you know, a Christian, if you're married to an unbeliever, if they're pleased to dwell with you, you know, and there's no problem there. Yeah, fine. Stay with them. That's not an issue. But, you know, in this day and age, how often do you see that? I've never seen it. So, um, and that's why I'm going to be rebuking this page of probably tomorrow sometime. Uh, this transform wife page. Um, she's a papist too. Uh, works salvationist, the whole deal. So, um, basically it tells women that, you know, you're an adulterer if you divorce and remarry and stuff like that, which is retarded. I can disprove that and easily. So, but yeah, you're going to see some of the nutty things she believes. So anyway, that's going to be it. Yep. So we'll see everybody in the next video or whenever. And, and I, Oh, got to say one other thing real quick here. Uh, we are going to be doing some kind of a live streaming thing. I don't know when, whatever, you know, sometime I'd like to do a, something not even sure who all would be involved in it, but the thing of uh, the fact that people say, well, the the uh, Roman Catholic Church they teach the right some of the right things. There is some truth that they teach that is not true at all. Everything that the Bible teaches, the Roman Catholic Church will twist it. You know, everything. They don't really believe in the virgin birth. Uh, they add their own stuff in with it. They don't believe in the authority of Scripture. Uh, their Trinity teaching obviously is corrupt so you know we'll do that at some point in time in the future not sure when yet but that'll be another thing so yeah absolutely so um, all right don't forget about the uh don't forget about the pacifism thing too that we're supposed to do eventually mm -hmm. yeah i'd like to do that too i know chandler would like to do that with us because he's big on the no pacifism thing so and tim because we're all gun owners so so yeah, but yeah. All right, guys. Well, I'll, I will end it here and uh, thank you all for being here and um, see you in the next video. God bless you guys. All right.